The Messy Podcast is sponsored by Eternity Bible College. Eternity is dedicated to providing a debt-free education with courses taught by hands-on practitioners just like myself. To learn more, visit eternity.edu. Welcome to the Messy Podcast, a podcast about the messiness of life and the transforming power of the gospel. Uh, My name is Scott Mell, a pastor at Cornerstone Church of West Los Angeles, and this podcast is sponsored by Eternity Bible College. This is the first episode of this new podcast where we're going to explore different issues and struggles from, from a biblical counseling perspective, actually maybe, hopefully, even more accurately, just simply from a biblical perspective, and and discuss how the gospel meets us in the various messes we face. So uh, this week, I have the privilege of getting to talk with Deepak Reju. Deepak is the husband to his best friend, Sarah, father to five children, a pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., the editor of the 31-Day Devotional for Life series, and co-author of Build on Jesus, a comprehensive guide to gospel-based children's ministry, as well as Rescue Plan and Rescue Skills, which are both on the topic we're going to be discussing today. And so you can follow him on Twitter, Facebook. Um, But Deepak is here with me to talk about the mess of pornography. Um, As we start off this new podcast, we're just going to jump into the deep end. But the the reason for that is... uh, Porn is more accessible today than it has ever been in all of history. Um, it's it's not that just that it's accessible if you want to go find it. I think in a lot of ways we have to avoid it. Um, if we're it, we have to be active to try to even avoid it. And and given how common it common it is, um, I just don't think there's any way that our uh, that in our local churches, we are talking about it um, enough. Deepak, thanks so much for being with me today and, and talking with me about this. Glad to do it. Glad to be with you, yeah. Scott. Yeah. So at, at its most basic, why don't we talk a little bit about just how we define the struggle of pornography? Basically, what is pornography and, and why is it a, a problem? Why is it something we need to talk about in the church? Yeah, so when we're speaking of pornography, we're referring to an addiction to sexual sin that really overtakes someone's life. Mm. So the person views naked people through images, videos, fantasizing about them. And for their own selfish pleasure, Christians arouse themselves by viewing someone else's nakedness and usually their sexual acts. Mm. And nakedness and sex are exposed, selfishly exploited, and then consumed by a bystander who's not their husband or wife. And in today's world, the ever-expanding ways in which we engage with sexual content and get addicted are, are just growing and growing. So you've got sexting, phone sex, reading about sex in trashy fiction or erotica novels, amni, virtual pornography, and the list goes on and on. Now, you know, the, the word I used there was addiction. You want to take a moment and should we talk about that? Well, like, what, yeah, what on earth yeah, do we mean by that? Yeah, yeah, why don't we? That'd be great. Um, cause you know, I, I love Ed Welch's definitions of it. I think they, they basically serve as a, a, a standard for us, which is he, he talks about voluntary slavery mm. or desires run amok. And so if you do voluntary slavery, you, you think about the paradox of that voluntary, there's a time in which I choose this carnal desire, this carnal desire acts out. I choose sin. And yet I keep coming back to it and I come back to it so often, eventually I enslave myself in it. Mm. So voluntary slavery, there's a responsibility I have because I choose it and I keep choosing it. Eventually I I become enslaved to it such that it's overrun my life. Mm -hmm. Um, And I still have a responsibility to fight my way out of it. And yet there's a kind of enslavement that's there. That's not the case when I first made that choice. Mm. Um, And then desires run amok. It's just, Gets to that fundamental thought that there are desires that are central to how we run our life. There are things that I want out of life. There's things I'm going after. There's things that I, I crave. And there are good desires. I mean, it's good for single man or woman to desire a godly husband or wife. But there are also wicked and carnal desires that overrun my heart. Um, and when those desires take over my life, it's the basics of addiction. 
yeah. the basic things of what we mean in terms of addiction. Because the yeah. culture's loaded the term with addiction, with all kinds of ideas. But if you take those two fundamental concepts, mm -hmm. voluntary slavery and desires run amok, you, you begin to let scripture open up and inform our understanding of what an addiction really is. Okay, so uh, that, that's super helpful. And I think it, it's actually clarifying for me too, because I think sometimes we think about, um, we think about pornography only in its most radical sense, but that that I, that addiction, that those desires run amok, I mean, what I hear you saying is that that, that can then um, apply to, you know, trashy novels. Like it doesn't have to be a picture, right? It could be a description or, or even, and I think, maybe most concerning to me. And I think one of the things that I've, that guys, men and women that I end up talking to find most confusing are the, the, the plethora of entertainment today that, it, you know, it wasn't produced as a porn movie, but it has pornographic scenes. Oh yeah. And they're like, Oh, well, well it's not porn, right? It's just oh, a, yeah. I uh, sure like does, does in your head does that qualify is that is like is that what we're talking about too oh oh yeah oh yeah definitely and i mean you nailed it when you talked about it at the beginning like we're in a culture that's so over sexualized you can't you can't exist in this culture and not have to like fight to avoid all the sexualized content that surrounds us mm. no matter where you go yeah, and yeah. it's it's just hard to deal with this and yet uh, you know i'll just use example you talked about earlier trashy novels, you might think, wow, that's an addiction. And yet mm. if you listen to someone who's hooked on the hardcore sexualized content of some of these novels, mm. they use all the same kind of addictive language. I want yeah. it. I can't resist it. I keep going back to it. It's overtaken my life. I don't want to give it up. All the same kind of language, mm. which goes back to that, oh, the cravings are there. And the cravings have overtaken them. Mm. And, you know, anybody listening has wants and desires, and they have bad wants and desires that are getting in the way of what they really should be pursuing. So yeah. they should be able to relate to this on some degree and some level as, as they're beginning to, to think about it. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I think that, that's so interesting because I think that what I hear in that as well is uh, the expression I hear from people where they're like, well, I... I can't not watch the next season of my favorite show just because it's gone in this pornographic direction or just because it has these, you know, pornographic views. And, and I think sometimes they don't question what it is. We, we don't question what it is inside of us that's driving us, that, that, that's drawing us to say, I need to watch this. I need yeah. to engage with this, right? I need to, to read this. Well, and then so let's just take the picture of the, the desires. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I'll use the word picture. Let's just, for the sake of our conversation, let's just call it. I'll use the word picture of like a dragon, like a, a monster, or some kind of beast. Yeah. yeah which is yeah. The, the my imagery just for like the sinful flesh. And what does scripture tell us? You feed the flesh, it grows. Mm. So, you know, you don't have to be looking at what we'll call hardcore porn, whether it's, you know, just images or videos. Yeah. Um, every time I look at any kind of sexualized content, whether it's I steal a look at a magazine cover that's, that has an over-sexualized picture, mm. or I go to an R-rated movie and I let myself watch a brief sexual scene, what I have done, I've fed those desires mm. and I've provoked the arousal within my body mm. and you started my mind to fantasize and run in a certain direction. Yeah. Um, so... No, nobody's going to get away with, in my mind, telling me that yeah. that sexual scene, even though it's brief, is not doing anything to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, the provocative ad on the side of the news website or the sports website. Yeah. I mean, it's so yeah. I'll put that in the category of like, we'll call it soft porn. It, it may not mm -hmm. be nakedness or sexual scenes, but what they're trying to do and say, like the advertising is for it to be tantalizing and revealing enough that mm. it's trying to provoke you. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. know exactly what they're doing. They're going after <laughs> for you. For sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and, and, and they're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to do it because they are so sure, right? Um, okay, okay, so that if that's what we're talking about, right? If that's the struggle we're talking about, then I think it only 
uh, highlights the fact that this is is everywhere and a struggle for everyone. Like this is something that we we have to be talking about constantly in in the life of the church. And so what what I want to do is um, recognize that that God then has proact- called us to proactively pursue one another when we're caught up in the mess of pornography and when this struggles in this midst of the church and to help us understand. And I want to talk through it. How do we understand how we are called to, to offer gospel care in the midst of this? And so um, the, for these podcasts, the, basically the definition of gospel care I'm going to use is the gospel care, what we're call, how we're called to minister to one another is, is the God exalting grace saturated act of loving another Christian through patiently knowing sacrificially serving truthfully speaking and consistently applying the gospel in order to help them become more like Jesus. And so what I, what I want to do together then is, and, and I would love to, to glean from you and your experience, Deepak, as you know, I, I understand these concepts in some ways generally, but as we apply them to specific struggles, you know, uh, we, there's so much more we could all learn. So I want to unpack some of these concepts of knowing and serving and speaking and gospeling as they apply specifically to pornography. So maybe we start with knowing, because I think one of the mistakes we can make, I know one of them, <laughs> let's start with me. One of the mistakes I make is assuming that every struggle with pornography is the same, right? That, oh, you know, if you struggle, then, then if I've walked with struggles before, if I walked through my own struggle, then, then okay, I, I know what you're, what you're doing. But I think as we recognize in any struggle, different people's struggles are unique. So in, in seeking to understand each person's unique struggle, as we seek to, to not just minister to them in general, but minister to people specifically, what, what are some of the questions we should be asking? You know, if, if I have a friend who's struggling with his my, my life, how, what are some of the questions I should be asking those who are struggling with porn in order to understand the nature of their struggle specifically? Yeah, yeah great, great, great thought. Great question to think about overall questions we want to ask. Yeah, this gets to the basics of like being a, a loving person who's patient and willing to listen and mm. to know someone before you make any assumptions and dive in to try and do something about their life. And so we, if we think about the range of questions you want to ask. Uh, I've, I have, um, with uh, Jeremy Pierre from Southern Seminary, mm-hmm. we've used a fourfold framework often to kind of categorize things that helps us think about it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that helps us then think about the range of questions we want to ask. So we talk about um, um, God, spiritual issues as one category. Mm-hmm. So anything okay. to deal with God, faith, sin, repentance, um, trust, hope, shame, guilt, Um, then uh, the second category would be people. So my context of relationships around me, Mm. then circumstances, what is the context I'm in? uh, And then inner, my heart and my mind. Mm. Uh, If there's an outer person, there's also an inner person, my soul, heart and mind. And how how do I deal with that? Mm -hmm. Um, So I'll I'll start, I'll start with this. I mean, everyone's got a context. I want to get to know their context. So I want to ask enough questions just to get to know like who they who they are within the context of their life, and what what do I what do I mean by that? Mm. In terms of co- context questions. Well, you know, when it comes to pornography, I want to get them to generally describe to me, you know, what their struggles have been like. Uh, I want to mm. know what are the patterns and triggers, times of days, locations, sites, the rituals. I don't know the frequency. How often has it happened? I'll ask them about the last two months, the last six months, the last year. I want to know their history of sexual immorality because I'm walking in at a particular moment. So I want to know how long it's gone on and, you know, a big difference between someone who started struggling as a teenager and mm. someone started struggling six months ago. Uh, and especially because most of the guys or gals who are coming to me are in their 20s or 30s. You started as a teenager, then we're talking about a decade into the battle. Yeah. When they show up into my my office and starting to have a conversation. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so what's interesting to me though, what I hear you say is that like we need a lot of details, right? You need a lot of context to understand where this is coming from. The I I, I felt this like this um, this recoil though because we we want it to be detailed, but we don't want it to be explicit, right? We don't want explicit information. Yeah, that's a great great thought. Yeah. Like, how, I, well, how does that how does that work? Well, I I'm not telling I'm not telling them. Tell me 
every kind of pornography in explicit detail of what you're looking at. Yeah. I'm just telling me, when did you start looking at pornography? Got it. How long yeah. have you been looking at pornography? You know, there's a big difference between like, hey, and uh, I, I looked at it for five minutes to I looked at it for five hours. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just, it, yeah. it just tells me a huge difference in like how it's consuming your life mm. um, in, in that sense. So I need some contextual factors to get to know like what the battle looks like. What I'm mm. trying to do when I'm talking about the context or the circumstances is mm. get my, my, a sense of of get my hands around, get my mind around, like what what kind of battle is this? Because mm -hmm. if it's a little skirmish that happens occasionally, okay, well, there's some things we can do about it, but if it's been 10 years and it's mm -hmm. overtaken their life and they spend multiple times a day and hours every day consumed with it, okay, there's a different kind of a battle that we're facing totally. in helping to turn their turn their life around. So. That's the yeah. context part of it. And I, I want to address context because uh, at first, what we need to do is we do need to put up some kind of boundaries, hmm. firewall protection to help slow down the consumption of pornography. Mm -hmm. And just to make it clear at the very beginning, that kind of firewall protection, blockers, general term I'll use is boundaries. Mm. Um, that, that's not going to save them. Mm -hmm. We'll get into the spiritual issues, the heart issues, the other things that are there. But what it does is it slows down the consumption. Um, it helps to begin to help them have some breathing room so that we can even talk about the heart issues yeah. um, in, in that sense. So I want to start sure. with the context and the circumstances, and work through all the boundary issues. And that means I'm going to get them to talk to me about each one of their electronic devices. Mm. I, like. Tell me about your phone. Tell me about your computer. Tell me about your tablets. Tell me what you have on there. Tell me about what have you put on in terms of software protection. Do you mm. use the restrictions? Um, are you mm. down? Are you able to download apps? Is there? Is there? Are, what? What's on there? Mm. Then I'm going to shift into conversations about heart issues, the inner war. Tell me about where your heart's at. Tell me how you battle. Tell me some of the motivations behind it because it's not just lust. Mm. There, there are reasons for why people act out in pornography. And if we yeah. reduce it to just lust, we lose sight of the fact that image bearers are motivated by different wants and desires. And so we've got to come to understand those wants and desires to get really behind the reasons why they're acting out in the first place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that, that's so helpful. And I think so, um, so insightful. And what I, I hear in that is this vision for one another care that's more than just let's talk about sin let's give you a bible verse let's you know study it and look at your heart although that's a huge part of it and we're we're going to talk about that but there's there's also a, this practical coming alongside right that we're we're going to ask questions about not just about their heart but about the broader context and how we can care for them how we can slow down the the process and what, what practical tools we can use alongside these these heart tools yeah that, that, that yeah we're using yeah it's exactly right and well and as as i want to get behind the motivations i also want to see what what kind of gospel affections are there or are they dead mm. i mean because faith is going to be the wind in the sails that's going to move this whole thing yeah and so if 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 their gospel affections have been basically squelched out by years of consumption of pornography, mm. uh, then I need, I need to understand that early on because uh, mm -hmm. beginning to pray with them and work at all the things that, that gets into that last, the third category of like, okay, what is your relationship with the Lord like? Mm. You know, what, what, is, what, what role does faith play right here? Mm. How much has guilt and shame overrun your life? How mm. much are you hiding now from God, let alone other people? Mm. Uh, you know, what does repentance look like for you? Is it false mm. repentance? And do you even know what that means? Do you mm. understand what the gospel is? Do, do you, so it gets into this third category of the, the God, faith, spiritual issues. And then the last one is, like, is people. Like, I just need mm. to understand who you're connected with. The biggest mistake is if somebody comes to me for me to take it all on myself. Mm. And, and so we're going to want gospel community yeah. To surround people and help them. And think, are you telling me I need to tell everybody? No. 
But is there a smaller inner circle like we all have that should know? Is there a few close relationships that need to be in the trench with me as I fight through this? Yeah. 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 So I'm going to deal with it as a counselor or pastor, but I want your small group leader to know. I want your roommate to know. And I mm. want us all to have, like conspire together for your good mm. to help you in regards to relationships and thinking together. So I don't want a guy showing up and talking with me without a small group leader present too, mm. or his best friend in the room. So all three of us can work through this together. Mm. Um, so that hits then context, heart, mind, inner issues, God, faith, repentance, shame, guilt, and then relationships. Mm. That's the kind of the fourfold. Yeah. And then all my questions are just going to show up in some of those categories along the way. It's just it, it, not that I have to, be reductionistic or like formulaic and think I need to do this and this and this. Totally real, real life relationships as uh, my friend, Robert Chong would often say is more like light jazz. I mean, there's a lot of improvisation as you walk into someone's life and you begin to experience the messiness of it. Uh, So I might have a lot of conversation about context first. And then because of a a ruptured relationship, we're going to spend a lot of time talking to a husband and his marriage. Yeah. Or there could be another conversation with a single adult who we're going to talk about the context first, but then, you know, I've got a lot of room to dive into stuff related to faith and the repentance and their hope and their shame. Mm-hmm. So yeah. as we get to know people, the conversations are going to look different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Man, those, those categories are so encouraging and helpful. I mean, and obviously apply to any struggle, but yeah. I, I, I find them really helpful even just thinking about them now, because I, I think that I, I do try to be intentional in asking questions, but I think sometimes we might get stuck in one category or another. Um, and so the, the breadth of those, those four different kinds of questions, I think kind of keep us moving, g- give us a, a holistic picture that maybe, you know, if we're only asking God questions or if we're only asking uh, people questions, right? Or if we're only asking, you know, external questions that, that, that we can, um, we can miss huge swaths of it. And, and we can assume certain things are true when they might not be, you know, maybe, maybe I, you know, I could feel the temptation to assume that I, I might assume that if you're struggling in this way, you don't have any gospel motivation or any, any you know, but there might actually be a lot of that there. You're just caught so in this slavery. Or I might be assuming that, Oh, well, I'm of course you're a Christian. You have gospel motivation. This is just a lust issue, but that, that that fire might be a lot dimmer <laughs> than I assume, and and so but before we can even dig in, we have to. There's so much to to, to gather, so much to dig into. Yeah, and it, um, it it helps me to have general categories. Absolutely, in in, in my yeah, mind, I love that. and then then it, it, it then all the thousands of questions can spill out from any one of those categories. Yeah, uh, that's where I need to be creative and thoughtful and specific for the person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're right, like. I can miss something hugely, say, for example, if I'm just so focused on rooting out the, the sin and the, the, the God issues and the repentance and the faith, and yet mm-hmm. I don't deal with their context or I don't deal with their relationships. Yeah. And none of this is, is usually covered in just one conversation. We're talking about <laughs> totally. ongoing conversations, yeah. ongoing relationship. So there's, there's a lot of things that spill out over the course of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so as that, and and I imagine too that as that plays out, you also don't neatly go from knowing and and listening and asking questions to to gospeling to to serve. You know, the, the categories are all mixed they all in together, overlap and mixed yeah. up together. Yeah. yeah. So so as you do seek to apply the gospel, um, I mean, I, I tend to think of, and I feel like I've been taught to think of. The, the need for the gospel in two main categories, right? One, the category of suffering, right? That, that needs to be redeemed. And one, the category of sin, right? Where that, that needs sanctification. Um, I think when we think about pornography, I know when I think about the struggle with pornography, suffering isn't, so I want to start with suffering and then go to sin, but what, suffering isn't usually what I think about, right? I, I, I'm like, oh, this is a sin issue. Obviously it's a sin issue. What we need to talk about is sin. But I think, I feel like even more recently in, as I've been talking with different men and women who struggle with this, understanding the suffering people have experienced that either acute 
or even just small and ongoing that, that contributes to this struggle um, has gained even more context for me. Uh, how have you seen suffering contribute to people's struggle with porn? Or is, is that even appropriate to be talking about? Or is this just a sin issue and we should just talk about sin? Oh, yeah. Well, so I'd say yes, yes, yes. Suffering mm-hmm. is going to set us up for mm-hmm. making foolish decisions. Yeah. And so just to give some concrete examples so people get a feel for what, what on earth are we talking about? Yeah. Uh, l- l- let me give a situation, a couple of different situations. So someone loses a loved one. Mm. So, you know, I had a, I had a, a brother who had a tragic death of a sibling. Mm. Um, and in his grief every year, as you know, grief over death and loss of death, uh, close love, loved ones, family members, mm. often the anniversaries are dreadful because mm. um, it brings back all the pain. Well, you know, if, if, if you're not in gospel community or you don't have the right outlets or you don't have the right kind of directions to go with that pain and that hurt or that anger or that confusion, mm-hmm. one of the things you're going to do is you're going to act out by looking at things that you shouldn't. Mm. Why? You know, strangely, you think, well, why would you do that? That's just lust. Well, no, mm. for some people, it numbs the emotions that are inflamed on this kind of anniversary. For some people, it just brings kind of a distorted form of comfort Mm. because they're not alone when they're isolated in their hurt and pain. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, that would be one example. Another example, I mean, a young lady I I had helped who grew up in a dreadful family situation where her Mm. father basically called her an idiot all of her life, physically abused her when she was younger, and so she grew up with this sense of worthlessness and she walked around. If you listen to her self-talk, it was very self-condemning. Mm. Her, her, her sense of identity, even though she came to know the Lord, she still walked around with a lot of this baggage from having grown up. Mm. A sense of identity that basically said to herself that you, you must be an idiot because mm. you can't do anything well in this life. Well, what, what do you find after that kind of suffering? She goes after pornography that confirms her sense of worthlessness. Mm. You know, so if, if you come to understand yeah. what she's looking at, yeah. all, it, it fits with the history that's mm-hmm. there. That kind of suffering gravitates her towards a certain kind of pornography mm-hmm. that basically makes certain people worthless in the actual mm-hmm. act of pornography. You know, mm-hmm. the kind of s and stuff where yeah. one dominates another that it brings out some of these same kind of themes that that someone who's been abused will have experienced in the context of abuse. Yeah. I mean, that's just two examples of like, like wow, look at what the suffering, two very mm-hmm. different kinds of situations, but how then they gravitate towards porn to find, and, and they gravitate for porn for very different reasons too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what an incredible example of the, the differences in diversity of, of, suffering and of situations that can contribute to this. So what, what, what do we do with that? Right. How, how does the gospel speak uniquely to that, that, that type of suffering that people experience? Is that something we should address biblically or how do, like, how do we confront that? Well, yeah, I mean, we do, we do. The gospel does help us in the midst of our, our suffering. So for example, one, um, if I just reduce both of those situations to lust issues, I would miss the deeper issues that are there. Yeah, yeah. And and that that that's I think a typical rookie mistake. Mm. You know, I set up a bunch of accountability for these two people, and just push them in terms of accountability. Make sure you have the firewalls, and make sure you check in with me regularly. Mm. But I never get to the kind of the deeper wells of suffering that they're mm. experiencing. I'm not going to make a connection between that suffering and the acting out in pornography. Mm -hmm. So does the gospel help us in our suffering? Yes, of course it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, didn't we have a savior who suffered for us? Yeah. Didn't, didn't, didn't Christ in as, as Isaiah prophesies about him, live as a suffering servant for us and therefore Mm -hmm. endured shame uh, on, on our behalf, endured mm. the, the wrath of God on our behalf, endured mm. the 
the punishment and the brutality of those who attacked him on our behalf? Didn't he do yeah. all that for us? And so he yeah. does understand our suffering. Yeah. He is a high priest who sympathizes with our suffering. Yeah. He's, a, he's a high priest who went through all of those. He's a suffering servant who himself suffered and understands the kind of experience of suffering that we've been through. Yeah. So we start there with, with the suffering part of it, like the gospel gives the Savior who suffered, and so mm. that Savior knows what we've been through. And that, yeah. that builds a bridge into our suffering. But then we enter into the other part of it. What, is the, what, what, what does sexual sin often do? It makes us hide, makes mm. us run away, and makes us ashamed. And so does the gospel speak to our shame? Does it help us? Well, yes, Christ covers over our nakedness where we're exposed. Yeah. He's the garment that hides our nakedness when we're ashamed. I mean, that's what we see in the Garden of Eden. What did God do? He killed an animal to construct coverings for Adam and Eve. Genesis mm. 3.21. I mean, mm. that was the first act of mercy for the first couple. Yeah. Now you pair that with the gospel promise in 3.15, that the, the woman's seed would one day crush the serpent's head, mm. and the seed we know is Christ. Well, Jesus came to earth to cover people. You know, and that's from mm. everything from the priest with dirty clothes in Zechariah 3, 3 to 5, to believers clothed in the character of Christ. So Christ will conceal the exposed. Mm. Jesus comes and welcomes the rejected and the outcast into God's family. So, you know, think of John 4, the Samaritan woman, um, mm. who obviously had a sexual history, having been with a number of men. And when does she come to the well? In the middle of the day, the hottest mm. part of the day. Mm. And what does Jesus do? It's so unfair to have a conversation with Jesus, because he knows <laughs> all of your history, even yeah. before you ever tell him anything. Yeah. And so he himself tells her about her own history with men, and she's shocked by it. Mm. She's shocked by it. I mean, she's so shocked by it, she changes the conversation to worship. And yet, what does Jesus do? He welcomes this outcast woman into mm. the loving embrace of the kingdom. Mm. And through Christ, the rejected and outcast are justified and adopted into God's family. Now, mm. but the thing that most people feel when it comes to this kind of shame is really the dirtiness or the uncleanness that you have in the experience of participating in sexual sin. Mm -hmm. Well, then you think of a leper in Matthew 8. What, what does the leper say to Jesus? If you're willing, make me clean, is the leper's mm -hmm. request. And, you know, what we often see is Jesus says to them, well, be clean. Uh, he uses the power of words. Mm -hmm. But what does he do with the leper? Matthew 8, he reaches out and touches him. And he says, be clean. Uh, and, and what does that do? It's like, man, he breaks all the rules of that culture in terms of not dealing with the untouchables, about avoiding them, about condemning them. Jesus reaches out and touches a leper. And those around the leper would have said, what, what was the use of that? And yet the leper just made Jesus unceremonially unclean. And yet Jesus doesn't care. Think of it this way, if we lose sight of the fact that the Holy One touched a leper and he's the Savior of the world, well, what, what were we talking about? The clean touches the unclean and makes him clean. He welcomes a leper into the kingdom. So, you know, you ask me, does the gospel have anything to say about this? Yeah, it does. It has something to say to the, both the sufferer and the shameful. Yeah. It's, it's robust in its application to what we do with pornography. Mm. Wow, that, I mean, that's so powerful because it's, it's the gospel not only speaks then to the suffering that helps contribute to pornography, but even the suffering and the shame that comes as a result of it. And, and what, it make, man, what, what it makes me think, Deepak, is that there's just so much um, compassion we can have that this is, not just that, that it is a, a huge sin issue and that, that, that ought to be met with the, the strength of, of righteousness and the transforming grace of Christ. And also it's a struggle that I, I wouldn't wish on anybody like, and that is the result of, of life in a fallen world 
with all these different compounding factors and that only compounds those factors even more, leaving us um, afraid and ashamed and seeing, it's just so powerful, seeing the, the, the picture, the person of Jesus, how he interacted with people, how he spoke to people and picturing in ourselves, even just the opportunity to show that kind of grace, to extend that kind of compassion to strugglers is such a, um, yeah, I think it's just such a powerful vision. Yeah, and Scott, vision. to build on your idea of compassion there, yeah. I think an assumption a lot of people can make is that what we're dealing with is just these sexually crazed people who, you know, got caught in this when they were a teenager and it's just a lust <laughs> issue. And yet if you take the examples I gave, Mm-hmm. Show compassion to that guy who lost his brother in a tragic accident. And mm. every year comes the anniversary and there's a deep sense of pain. Or show compassion to that woman who, as a child, was beaten by her father and told she was an mm. idiot. Mm. And so now, as a grown adult, is like looking for some place to be accepted in the world. Yeah. And, and yet what she does is... She just goes out and keeps confirming her sense of worthlessness. Mm -hmm. So if you just put up firewalls and tell them this is a lust issue and that they just need to check in once a week, (laughs) you're just not getting to the deeper wells of issues that are in their hearts, their minds, their lives. And you're not you're not showing the kind of compassion that welcomes them into the kingdom. Now, are there people who go off the rails and are going after sin and lust in a way that needs to be stopped and rebuked and condemned? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly, there, there, there is rebuking involved in certain situations, but I think we often miss the situations that really need our compassion mm. to welcome people because so often those people have walked around and have sought out accountability that has essentially been reductionistic and not gone after some of the deep wells of suffering and pain that mm. they've experienced and not really brought that out into the situation and helped them sort through that. Mm. You know, that's, that's so powerful. And it makes me think, I, I, I think we underestimate n- not just the, the kindness of compassion. I think we underestimate the transforming power of compassion that, that demonstrating that compassion, showing that compassion, reminding them of Christ's compassion isn't just comforting, it's also transforming. Sometimes that's what is, is uh, unlocks the, the, the freedom from these, the, the, these struggles in, in so many different ways. So I, that's, well, and then what, what that's does scripture helpful. mean when it says God's kindness leads us to repentance? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Oh, okay, well, what is that? I mean, is, yeah. is there compassion? Is there love? Is there grace? Is there hopefulness? For the, the, the sufferer who is ashamed and is clearly lost mm. and needs a guide, <laughs> mm-hmm. needs yeah. somebody to step in there with them and not to be reductionistic about their sin, not to be simplistic about it, but also to just, you know, knowing that this is going to take time, mm-hmm. pull that all out, to walk alongside of them and, yeah. and, to, and to help them through this. Yeah, oh, exactly, exactly. Okay, okay, so... There is the, the the suffering component. There's also the at the same time this these actions come from deep seated idolatries that we end up pursuing, right? Uh, and 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 come from our hearts that are seeking to to worship ourselves instead of God. And, and it, it's this mix of both suffering, which deserves compassion, and 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 sin and self worship that that requires correction and acknowledgement and correction. Um, what are some of the heart idols? And we, we've talked about them a little bit, but what, what are some of the heart idols you tend to find when pe- with people that are struggling with porn? Yeah, and Scott, uh, making all the caveats that we said earlier in terms of yeah. uh, making sure we understand with a specific person in front of us and not create a reductionistic template of like, here's five reasons, but just a totally. range of examples yeah, And going, going back, we said earlier, porn habits are not just a lust issue. They're not purposeless. They're reasons for it. Mm-hmm. Well, what are some of the reasons? Is, is somebody greedy and reckless in their pursuit of pleasure? That's the mm-hmm. most obvious thing that we're going to think about when we think about sexual sin. Okay. But, you know, take, for example, a, a student who in the middle of a Saturday afternoon is just sheer boredom of, of a 
pietistic lifestyle. Mm. And so they're looking for some sense of adventure or, you know, look, look at a, a, a husband who's angry and bitter at his wife for feeling rejected and neglected over the course of their marriage. Mm -hmm. What's he going to do? Well, he's going to act out and looking at porn as a, as a form of revenge. Mm. Or how, how about um, someone who's looking for some sense of affirmation or comfort? I mean, I, yeah. I've had husbands talk to me not about the bodies of a woman that they're looking at, but the way that woman looks at them. Mm. You know, their eyes and the way they stare at them there's a sense of that woman desires them. Mm. Well, for, for, for someone who is not experiencing the kind of intimacy or joy or acceptance, it, it's a really distorted form of yeah. looking for affirmation and, and, and hopefulness or encouragement, but it, it, that's part of what it is when you begin mm. to, to parse it out of what, what it is that they're looking for. So they're looking for some kind of yeah. affirmation or comfort. Or, yeah. you know, the classic example of, are they trying to find some version of escape from stress mm. or pain or disappointment in life? I had, I had a guy who, when stress just went through the roof at work, and he just couldn't handle it anymore, he would shut the door and just plunge himself into porn for a little while. Mm. That, that was his escape out of life. Yeah. Or, you know, deal with an older single woman who all her desires for marriage have not materialized into anything. Mm. Well, what does she do? Well, she goes home, plunges herself into a fantasy world of mm. whether it's pornography or trashy novels to arouse all the hopes and fantasies that she has. Mm -hmm. um, and what's behind all that? Well, I mean, there certainly is lust there, but you go deeper and like, there's yearnings for good things that's not satisfied, so she creates a false paradise yeah. for herself in yeah. the pornography, in the trashy novels, in the fantasizing, mm. uh, in, in, in those things. I mean, that's just some, some examples that I could give yeah. you. It's just yeah, go yeah, through yeah. different kinds of things that are motivators for people. Yeah. No. Okay. So that's, and I think that's super helpful because I think it does help to give us some examples of not, not just the, the different forms of suffering that can contribute, but also the, the diversity of desires that manifest in this way that, uh, I mean, you, you said it earlier, right? You, you called it a, a rookie mistake to just assume this is lust and we just need to like, you know, put up barriers. Um, so with that, potential diversity of different motivations and things going on in different people's hearts. How, how do you go about graciously trying to draw out and identify maybe what each person might specifically be struggling with in, in terms of idolatry? Yeah. Okay. So the basics uh, you, you want to put as precursors always is listen carefully, mm -hmm. ask heart oriented questions, not just factual questions. So dig after mm -hmm. What are the deep wells going on there? Mm. And be patient because this is going to take time to work through it. Mm. But then, you know, a couple of basic things that I think, uh, and I'll run through a couple of categories. Mm -hmm. So one, I need to be willing to be tough, not be superficial in my conversations with them. Mm. In, in, in that sense, like, I mean, I sometimes use the word intrusive. Some people don't like that, but mm. there's a difference between saying, well, how's your day? And yeah. are you lying to me? Mm. <laughs> That yeah. second question is pressing into you a bit more. It's demanding yeah. something of you. Yeah. And I need to be willing to ask some harder questions. Uh, and on, on the side of the person who's coming to me for help, they just need to be honest and vulnerable. Um, yeah. So if I ask questions and have some sense like, oh, you're just being superficial. You're not going to let me get into the deeper wells of your life. Mm -hmm. Well, I need to not press in if they're not ready but I also need to get to a place where you trust me and you're willing to share with me some of the harder things. Mm. That's number one. Number two, I need to be consistent and frequent if this is a significant struggle. Mm. If, if I'm inconsistent, that's not going to help if this is something that's overtaken the person's life. Yeah. yeah. So there's going to be a regular engagement, a regular rhythm of being, uh, being in conversations and texting and meeting up and talking and, doing life together, that's just going to be really important for mm -hmm. me to be involved in a person's life. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it needs to be local. This is the deception of technology. 
Mm. So the conversation I'm having with someone will be like this. It'd say, okay, so who, who's involved in your life? And they say, uh, my best friend. Okay, where's your best friend? Well, we were roommates in college. Yeah. Okay, where'd you go to college? Uh, and I'm in D.C. pastoring mm. in singles and marrieds in D.C. They'll say, oh, well, I went to, you know, Ohio State. And where does he live? He's still in Ohio. Oh, okay. Is that the one guy who knows? Yeah, he's, he's my main accountability. Yeah. We check in about once every other week. Mm-hmm. And then my question then to them is, well, you're a member of our church. Why wouldn't you let somebody in your own church know about this? Yeah. I mean, I'm your pastor, but yeah. did your roommate, did your small group leader, did your closest friends here know about it? Mm. Uh, and so I'm not cutting out his best friend from Ohio State. That's fine for them to be added mm. in, but... There's, there's a kind of power and effectiveness in letting people who are in your life day to day be the main source of accountability in your life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, that then taps to the communal part of it. Uh, I'm not yeah. going to be the only one. We want a couple yeah. of people, which we mentioned earlier, to yeah. be a part of it. We want also for the person to be connected to gospel community mm. overall. And then word-focused the word has got to be a basic part of normal conversations. Mm. Uh, if I'm just giving him my opinion all the time, that's just not going to help him out of this issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it needs to be gracious and encouraging. So if I am militant, <laughs> I'm cracking down all the time. If I'm condemning and belittling, how often is he or she going to show up again? No, oh, not that often. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if they walk away encouraged that they can do battle with this and I'm going to be in the trench with them and there's going to be a few others, we're going to work alongside of them and that we're not doing this for a short-term fix. Mm. Like I'll say to people like, okay, if you're asking me to be involved, well, I'm in it with you for as long as you're going to allow me to. Yeah. So if that means we need to be in this for weeks or months or years, well, sign me up. Let, let's yeah. do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I want them to feel hope like, okay, well, I, I'm no longer alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I that, mean, that's kind of the basics that I want to lay out. I mean, that's kind of different totally. categories to talk through. Well, like, absolutely. What and, absolutely. And, and, and what I love about those different categories is it, it also shows, like we talked about before, that these these concepts of taking time to know and ask questions and gospeling and massaging the gospel into people's tr- hearts and, and serving them with compassion, like they all overlap. You, you can't gospel without more good questions. Yeah. But you also can't ask questions without, you know, continually reminding and, and, and placing the gospel, right? There's, they're, they're all mashed together and they're, and they're helpful in the same way. I think in, as we think about categories, you know, w- am I missing anything? But in practice, it, it's all swirled together, and I, I, I love the, you know, I, I don't know, I, I don't mind, I don't mind talking about intrusive questions. I, I think that's, <laughs> I, I, I like that. Very, but I, one of the things that has struck me in our local church, and I've, I talked to a lot of our leaders about this because I was struck by how many people. This was particularly years ago, but I was struck by how many people, um, would tell me in, in the midst of having conversations like this, they, they would say, I no one's ever asked me questions that plainly before. And that shouldn't be the case in the church, right? That like the pastor shouldn't be the only, for lack of a better term, intrusive question asker, right? This is what community is, right? Community, community is enjoying and having barbecues and, and, you know, studying the Bible together and reading the Bible together and maybe talking about the sermon together. But community is also asking questions that, we know nobody else is asking. I, I mean, and if, if, if porn is such a big deal, if it's so common, I think it, it ought to be a question every person, every man asks the other men in this community group, every woman asks the other women in this small group, um, what's on your phone? Right. Yeah. What have you been watching lately? Oh, uh, you yeah. Know, I mean, like, I mean, these are just baseline questions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I, I want to know if some people will feel like a little awkward if you step out and ask some of these hard questions. And yet, for sure, for sure. there are going to be some people who are like, oh, my goodness, nobody ever asked me this. Yeah. And I've been yearning for someone to care enough to ask me some things that would give me a chance to open up my life. 
Mm. Uh, and and yeah. and so appreciative of what you're saying. Like we 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 really do want to be a community that's willing to not be superficial, but get under the surface of things, and let us have honest heart conversations with each other, yeah. so that we're living an honest and transparent life that the gospel encourages us to live uh, yeah. as, as as a community. And you know, this then sets us apart from the world. Mm. Absolutely. The, Absolutely. The, the, if, if gospel community can live in honest and transparent lives, it says like, well, it's different than the garden club or it's yeah. different from the bowling league. Yeah. I might have friendships there and I, I might talk about things, but how earnest am I able to be and have other people love on me and work, work through some of the hardest things in my life? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, if we're talking about how we are then different than the world, the, the goal then isn't just identifying these desires and idolatries, right? But but speaking gospel truth to them, not just identifying them, saying, look, it's deep. You got a bigger problem than you realize this is, you know, but, but acknowledging and reminding of gospel truth, really, I think, helping just massage that truth into their heart, applying that truth to this particular struggle as we think about how we are different than the world, how our community is different than the world, then um, how, how does the gospel speak specifically to idolatry and to the idolatries that motivate um, these struggles? Yeah. So let's let's think. Go back to the original definition that we were talking about: the voluntary slavery. But I'm going to go after the desires run amok. Uh, so the carnal desires, when they begin to overtake your life become ruling desires. They, they, they become things that become chief among all things in your life. They become inordinate desires. They, they, they're disordered desires. They make a, a mess of your life. A, a ruling desire, in my mind, is an idol. I mean, it's, it's the same thing as we're thinking of an idol. It's something that has become chief among all things. Well, we need to, I mean, what does Paul instruct us to do? We need to abstain from the desires of the flesh. Uh, we need to not feed the flesh. So a part of us taking the time to fight these ruling desires, these idols, is to just learn the discipline of abstaining. That's a discipline of heart. That's a discipline of mind. That's a discipline of even body. I mean, the Apostle Paul tells us about disciplining even our body. So we need to begin there, but if we think of Galatians 5, it talks not just, Romans 13 talks about uh, not feeding the flesh. Uh, 1 Peter talks about abstaining from the desires of the flesh. But Galatians 5 helps us thinking about, based about crucifying the desires of the flesh. And so we don't abstain just for the sake of like starving those desires, we abstain for the sake of like seeing them put to death. Mm. We, we want idols to be put to death on the altar of the cross. <laughs> I mean, so well, what does that mean? Like it means basically repentance and faith have to be a fundamental part of this conversation. A lot of times one of these, uh, whether it's a man or woman, someone who's struggling has often a false sense of what repentance is. Uh, you know, the kind of guilt that piles atop top of guilt that never really turns into a turning towards the Lord and, and reconciling with God first, and, and then coming to terms out of conviction of the Spirit, and then reconciling with other people, a genuine repentance. But then faith, you've got to trust in something other than yourself in order to get out of this problem. Too often, white-knuckling approaches are characteristic of how we deal with this, which means I'm reliant on myself to basically fight through this problem. Well, that's not repentance and that's not faith. Faith means I understand that there's something outside of myself that I need in order to deal with this. And that means trusting in Christ as my only hope in fighting through this. And that, you know, uh, one, one of our pastors talks about faith-driven repentance. I can't even turn from that sin unless I see the glory of Christ. Hmm. Yeah. Like Christ has to be in the driver's seat for my mm. gospel affections to be revived. Yeah. For my dead conscience to be revived. 
and yeah. for my carnal desires to be killed. And that's the, yeah. that's the unholy triad, I think, of addictions. Mm. It's the carnal desires, it's the dead conscience, and it's the la- lack of gospel affections. Mm. Um, and what, what we're looking for is faith is going to help me put to death those carnal desires. Faith is going to help me turn towards the one person who can bring life back to me, which is Christ. Yeah. And faith is going to revive a dead conscience that's yeah. long been since squelched over by these carnal desires. Yeah. Well, that's, I guess, so helpful because I think sometimes we can wonder why reminders of the glory of God's grace, why the reminders of Christ's forgiveness, like how would that motivate change, right? Like that, that we're, we're forgiven, that, that, that God's grace is sufficient, that it covers all of, even our, our uh, most ugly struggles with pornography and it's because it stokes those affections right when we recognize the goodness of of christ it stokes those gospel affections that really are the only thing that can motivate true change i think that's so yeah that's so helpful yeah well and so i don't want a a guy to come back or a gal to come back and say oh yeah you know i had a great week five days in a row that i didn't look at anything Mm. i mean they, they can say that but yeah. what I'm looking for more is for the saying like, oh, man, I, I felt convicted in the sermon. Mm. <laughs> or the word is starting to breathe more life into me. Mm. You know, as much as they should abstain from the pornography, yeah. that's not going to be the long-term solution to this. Abstaining from the desires of the flesh are not finally going to get them out of this battle. Wow. That affection for Christ and, and reviving that affection which means ultimately they have to turn to Christ. That's that's the beginning and the end of this whole conversation. Wow. Well, I I I'm not sure, even sure if, if everybody listening would may realize just just how deep and significant that is. That is, that is so important. And I think that to hear you say that 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 I don't even want there's something I want more. There's something we desire more. If we want them to become more like Jesus, if that's the goal, then there's something we desire more than just, oh, I came back and it's been a good five days, right? That's That Christ is after so much more because he's after growing himself in them. That's, that's, that's so helpful. I mean, it's, it's just a helpful reminder for me. Oh, okay, so... We, all these different ways that there are to, to gospel and apply the gospel, at the same time, like we talked about at the beginning... Um, as we do that, as we massage the, the truth of the gospel into people's hearts, we, we should also just be trying to help practically slow down the, the, the impact of this in the moment. Um, and we, we've talked about this a little bit, but beyond our words, what are some practical ways or even what are some practical tools that you have found helpful for strugglers? Maybe not the Maybe ones that that help them to internalize the gospel, but maybe some that just help them to deal in the crisis moment with the struggle of pornography. How, how can we be serving and helping people practically? Yeah. So let me let me can I talk about? I'm going to do a little bit of canoeing. We're talking about a river for a second. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. I mean, I one of the things that I think is a classic mistake is not helping people understand how to fight temptation. And how to mm. deal with the temptation when you're in the middle of the battle, like you're out mm. there, like on the street and you see something alluring. And there's a question of whether you're going to look. There's a question for some men and women, whether they're going to flirt, you know, whether they're going to engage. What do we do when we're facing temptation? So I'll, I will describe, let's talk about a river, upstream and downstream and midstream. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think often happens is people get stuck in the sin, they fight the sin, they give up, they give into the sin, and then they run to confess it to the people around them. Hmm. And so what I'm looking for is our conversation to be upstream. Long before you actually engage the sin, fall hmm. to it, come and confess to me, I want to be a part of the conversation. Hmm. So you want to be a part of the conversation as the thoughts are even just beginning to percolate. Exactly. So upstream is the thought is beginning to percolate, or I saw something and my body was like aroused, Mm. or I started fantasizing about something in the middle of the workday. 
you know, mm-hmm. that's the kind of internal war that's all started, an yeah. external war with my body that begins early on, midstream, that's upstream, midstream okay. is, okay, well, I know as a single guy living by myself that after 10 o'clock I can shut my door and plunge myself into porn when I'm all alone. Yeah. So I begin to scheme that afternoon. Or, mm. you know, in the, in, in the older days, uh, I was dealing with guys who would stop by the adult store and pick up something on the way home or grab mm. a magazine for that. Now it's like, oh, do I need to download an app in order mm. to be able to access because I can't get around these other parts of my firewall mm. and begin to scheme like, how do I get to the porn? That's midstream. Mm-hmm. Mm. Downstream is then I act out. Yeah. Uh, I go ahead and do it. Well, I, I think practically what often happens is, and, and you know, I'm in this with a couple of different people right now where I'm just begging them, like, don't just come confess to me after you've acted out. Mm. You need to bring me in early on. Mm. I want to be on the front end of temptation, not on the back end of a fall. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, 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 I need you to bring us in as community. So what does that mean? Well, I, I appreciate this. As, as a, there's a brother I'm starting to work with now. He's Brand new and getting help. He's never gotten help before. I'm really grateful he's been humble and is coming to get help. And I said to him after he fell a couple of weeks ago, I said, don't just, don't just confess to me afterwards. I would mm. love you at the moment you're feeling temptation, text me. Mm. Pick up the phone, call me. I might not be able to pick up right away, but I will get back to you as fast as I can. Yeah. And, and the excuse you come out, oh, I don't want to be a burden. You're a husband. Yeah, you got a family. Yeah. Like, buddy. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a minister of the gospel. <laughs> it's like, yeah. this is what I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I want to be in this with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that's practical enough, but that's saying, like, let's yeah. shift the tactics. Yeah. And let, let's get in there early. Mm. Let's get in it upstream rather than downstream. And yeah. you, if you do that, there's a lot we can do to head it off mm-hmm. before we get yeah. to that point where they're acting out on their own. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so helpful because I think we're we're trying to then serve them by being proactive, by pursuing, by opening doors uh, that aren't constantly in response to sin, but that are really about the, the growing and the building of this proactive discipleship, this proactive uh, intentionality uh, upstream from maybe the the incidents itself. Um, as so could we, pro- could we challenge the disciplers who are listening to this right now? Just think about it. For yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the challenge is to think, okay, think about the last few conversations and are they all confessions after mm. someone's acted out? Then, yeah. that, that, uh, then I'm saying to them like, okay, now you need to go back and think about having conversations, pleading with the person you're working with to let you in early on. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and am I only, as a discipler, am I only reaching out in response? Am yeah. I only ever reacting yeah. um, as opposed to, 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 to taking the opportunities kind of in between to, to build, to pursue, to engage? Yeah, yeah. So as you do that and as you help people kind of prepare, are there any um, uh, particular, I know there's tons out there, but any particular... Um, like software programs or apps or anything like that that you find particularly helpful or do you just kind of tell people like find what works for you? Yeah. You know, I, there's a, there's a, there are a number of different things on the market. There's free stuff. There's paid stuff. Yeah. I mean, the golden standard everybody talks about is covenant eyes. Mm-hmm. And I think covenant eyes is really useful and it's helpful to a lot of other people, but you know, I'm, I'm also thinking from the vantage point of a parent mm-hmm. um, too. And when you think about a parent, you're thinking about, okay, now we've got, I've got multiple teenagers at home, each of yeah. whom are getting to stages where they're getting their own devices. And yeah. like, what was hard about Covenant Eyes is like, okay, then I got to monitor individual downloads on individual devices and yeah. each one setting up different things, which is where um, there's That's now- That's kind of overwhelmed me. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I can't get to the number and I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh yeah, well, doing? so this is where a couple of others, so Circle would be an example. Yeah. Julie Lowe from CCF recommended- it at a conference, and then I started exploring where it's it's a difference where you're not just downloading the software to one individual device. Now mm-hmm. you're creating the filter at the level of the modem for the entire house, mm-hmm. which means you can organize everything 
at the level of the modem for every device within the home at one spot rather yeah. than having to go to every different device. And, you know, you should know what's going on in every device and be active in using the restrictions on each device. That's, that's, yeah. that's also something you should do. But is there a way to organize it if you're now, as, for example, as a parent mm -hmm. dealing with multiple people in the home, multiple teenagers or adult children, and mm -hmm. you want to be a help to them? Well, okay, Circle would be one example of s software programs that are out there that try and organize everything at the level of the modem rather than the level of the device. Yeah. Um, and, and so you just got to explore the different kinds of totally. softwares that are out there. There's a pretty totally. wide range of different things that are there. And think about the advantages, disadvantages. The one caveat I would say is often when people first enter into it, they look for the cheapest thing available. Mm. And mm -hmm. that's not necessarily the most helpful thing available. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like we got thrown in the deep end just this last year when all of a sudden all of our kids got school issued Chromebooks. Yeah. And so, so now we've got all these other devices with their school, uh, you know, uh, logins and everything on it. And so, yeah, we, you know, we, we're, kind, I think, kind of constantly having to re address those things and, and the home. But I think those are, and, and I think to your point earlier, that th these can be helpful tools in our discipleship in the home and outside of the home. Um, but none of them make anybody more like Jesus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so they can be helpful tools, but we need to understand them for what they are uh, as opposed to seeing them as some kind of solution. Yeah. We make good use of the tools that are there, but they're not the, they're not the beginning and the end of solving this problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So for those, if somebody's listening who is struggling with porn, I mean, obviously the first thing we would encourage them to do is that, like you said, engage with individuals locally, right? Talk with your pastor, talk with your small group leader, talk with your friends locally and, and then open yourself up in order to, to minister to one another. What, what other resources, um, Books, articles, websites, would you suggest to someone who, who might be struggling with porn right now? All right, I'll run, I'll run through. I got, I got a number of different ones that I could commend. Okay, that I awesome. think are highly of. So for men, for example, Closing the Window by Tim Chester, Hide and Seek by John Freeman, Finally Free by Heath Lambert, Sexual Sanity for Men by David White. All of those are solid chapter mm. books uh, and helpful to think through for women, um, Sexual Sanity for Women by Ellen Dykus. Ellen Dykus. But then mm -hmm. one that I discovered as I was doing the writing, didn't know mm -hmm. about, was Purity is Possible by Helen Thorne. It was just mm -hmm. gold. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know about it at all, but Hel Helen Thorne is BCUK's, one of their main writers, and she's putting out more material. They're just so yeah. wonderful for helping specifically women who are struggling with purity issues. Awesome. Then for anyone, the late David Paulison, Making All Things New, uh -huh. Restoring Joy to the Sexually Broken is, is I think, an, an, an amazing overall primer for people who are trying to think through this, whether you're a man or a woman, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in dealing with it. I mean, there's a ton of little booklets, too. It, there is uh, What's Wrong with a Little Porn When You're Married, Nicholas Black. He also did What's Wrong with a Little Porn When You're Single. Uh, Brian Croft's help. Uh, you struggling with pornography? Uh, David Paulson has one. Coming clean, breaking pornography. One on sexual addiction, and then Winston Smith's on masturbation, uh, and then Vicky Tidy's. Your husband is addicted to porn, and then you you know there's things that you want to think about in terms of teenagers, also children. So uh, Luke Gilkerson, who worked for Covenant Eyes for a number of years, he has a couple of different kinds of workbooks that you can work through with your teenagers and thinking through uh, issues of sexuality, seven lessons to make sense of puberty, the talk, seven lessons to reduce your child to biblical sexuality. Mm. Uh, the classic in my mind is uh, for working through with teenagers is Thoughts for Young Men by J.C. Ryle. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful read, good for reading to young men and young women. Um, mm think is a, a wonderful overview. Uh, Joel and Jessica, uh, Joel Fitzpatrick and Jessica Thompson mm -hmm. had mom, dad, what sex, uh, mm -hmm. th their, their, own, their own book on that. And then there's, 
you know, I, I don't know how well known it is. Stanton Brenda Jones did God's Design for Sex series. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the development. So it's it's what's useful is that it has developmentally specific books. So yeah. books for preschool, elementary, junior high, high school. I would want them to be a little bit more theologically robust. They're mm -hmm. not as robust as I wanted, but what they do is they give you a basic framework to start with, yeah. and then you can build on that as a parent to have conversations. Yeah. It, it does yeah. go after this one idea with teenagers of like, most parents kind of zoom in at a teenage stage, have this kind of talk, and then get out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm just not a big fan of that. Like with, with teenagers and children with technology from an early age, you've got to be engaged from an from from a very young age and helping them not only think about technology but get out ahead of it and establishing a biblical sexuality. Yeah. And so these yeah. books provide a basic framework of reading at every age and starting mm. the conversation, which is what you need to do as a parent. Yeah. No, I I, man, I, I so appreciate that because I think that's both those are both resources for strugglers, but also like we were talking about those, those are pro some of those are proactive resources. Right. So, so some of that can help us to uh, combat this, uh, assuming it's coming, assuming it's going to be a struggle for everybody, combat it by developing a, a biblical um, understanding of sexuality, a biblical uh, ideal for sexuality. And I think that maybe um, especially our younger believers, I feel like can tend to have their biblical sexualities defined simply by what they are not supposed to do, right? By the the no nos as a, but it's so powerful to to show them what God created it to be, so that they know why all these other things are are not what God designed. It's, it's so helpful. It's so helpful. A any other any specific resources for? someone who's wanting to minister or care for, like maybe they have a friend who's struggling in this way. Um, well, so, you know, I, I didn't pay you to ask this question, but you asked the question. So here we go. I mean, this I is, want you to talk about your, yeah, your resource. Absolutely. All right, so this is, this is why we wrote the two books where all the stuff I listed is really good in helping the struggler. What mm. we felt the burden for was, okay, well, how do we help the discipler the pastor, mm. the counselor, the small group leader, the parent, the roommate, the best friend get in the trench with the struggler. Yeah. That, that's the thing that I wanted to, to come up with, something that's more uniquely for the, the, the people who are coming alongside those to help them know what to do. So that's where Jonathan Holmes, uh, who's a good friend of you and for, yeah. for myself, he kindly yeah. paired with me to write Rescue Plan, which is the what, when, and why of dealing with pornography. Mm -hmm. And the key thing for that book is that it deals with the different stages. It deals with uh, teenagers, singleness, dating, and marriage. So when's the last mm -hmm. time you read a whole chapter on how does a girlfriend deal with this issue when her boyfriend first confesses that he's struggling? Mm -hmm. Or, yeah. you know, how does a parent yeah, yeah deal with it when a teenager comes f is caught in, in yeah. looking at pornography. Th th yeah. Those are things. Now, we add it in because women struggle with the issue, too, and it's often labeled as a man's issue. Uh -huh. We added a lot of material on helping, uh, helping disciples of women think through how to come alongside women who are struggling with it. And I think we've written probably the longest section on how to fight masturbation. Okay, so I actually wanted to talk about this specifically okay. because Let's go for it. the the section you wrote on masturbation was the single most comprehensive, most clear definition of a biblical view on masturbation I've ever read, and I th those two chapters in particular were. I mean, I, th the whole book is gold and super helpful. Those two chapters. Um, took me aback as just, I was just overcome with thankfulness for the clarity and for the, um, the unique contribution they provide to that question. That's a huge part of this struggle oh, that yeah. I think oftentimes gets kind of pushed to the side. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it's it, masturbation is the younger step sibling of this whole porn issue. Yes, it's, yes. It's, uh, it's paired up with this all the time, and yet everybody talks about the porn issue. And then if you settle mm -hmm. a porn issue, then we're settled. And yet, oh no, you know, mm. there's plenty of people who struggle with pornography, and maybe mm. that issue is not as bad anymore. But they've struggled with masturbation all along. Yeah. And there's a lot of confusing material out there because there's plenty of pro masturbation people who tell you that it's not an issue and just go for it. Yeah. And we're, yeah. what we're saying is it doesn't fit in God's design for yeah. sexuality. And yeah. so therefore we don't want to just lecture you. We want to give you real robust theological reasons why yeah. we think masturbation is not good for you. But then yeah. we want to come alongside of you and say, let's, let's now think about how to fight it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I found it so helpful, so helpful. And so I, I can't recommend it highly enough. And I think, you know, what my hope is, and I think that actually I hope that if people listen to this, they will uh, get those resources, which is interesting because when I first asked you to do this interview, I didn't even know about those resources. Uh, all I knew about was the, uh, the 31 day devotional. I know the, the work that you've done. I know your experience as a pastor. And so I thought that this would be something that you could really uh, help us with. And so that's my heart in uh, wanting to share this. And so I'm excited that there will be so such a robust resource, something more than just an hour long, you know, discussion, but something that we can work through, that I can work through, that the people in our church can work through um, and get that uh, that equipping. And so, I mean, but, but then there's also the second book as well. Well, yeah, and right? so here's, here's the story behind it where, and, and the publisher was very kind in this, <laughs> the middle section of the first book was supposed to be four or five skills. Um, oh. And the, the elders kindly gave me a sabbatical. And as I do, I start reading, researching, and kind of like uh -huh. plunge myself into it for a month. Mm -hmm. And what happened is what emerged was 22 skills. Uh, <laughs> so it was, it was too much material for a middle section. Yeah, so we yeah. pulled it out. And so rescue plan is what we just described. Mm -hmm. Rescue skills is 22 skills that now identifies if rescue plan is, is the what, when, and why, rescue skills is the how. Mm. How do I now get into the trench? Yeah. What do I need to do in terms of asking questions, coming alongside someone who's weary? How do we deal with the shame? What happens when someone's desires overtaken them? What do I do with those desires? You know, what, what's a sense of distorted beauty and how do we give them a vision of God's beauty and beauty of sexuality? Well, mm -hmm. how do we help transform in that direction? Uh, what does really good and solid accountability look like? I mean, there's mm -hmm. tons of skills that we've laid out mm -hmm. that our first part of the book is skills that a discipler needs to have. But then secondly, skills that a discipler exercises that then helps the, 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 the person who's struggling. Uh, yeah. So the things that they need to have that you're going to instill in them, yeah. like, you know, a stronger sense of identity or persevering through the weariness or a bigger picture rather than a reduced sense of just the sin. Just mm -hmm. lots of things that we equip them with. So 22 skills that you want to exercise as a discipler to come alongside of someone who's struggling. So we're not just going to give you the what, when, and why, which what I think a lot of the books do, mm -hmm. totally. but I want to also give you the how. Mm. So one of the questions we already got last week was like, well, why two books? Mm. Well, because we want to answer what, when, and why, but then we realize we also got to do the how. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what a what an incredible resource. So so I I've I've only read the original first draft of uh, Gospel Plan. I haven't read Gospel Skills yet, but, or, or not Gospel Skills, uh, the Rescue Skills yet, but I'm I'm so excited because I think that this is, you're exactly right, like this is exactly what, and not just us as pastors need, like those are the things that the small group leaders need, that the roommates, that the girlfriends, that the boyfriends, that the wives and husbands need um, to, walk through this, as we've been talking about, unfortunately, uh, kind of ever present dynamic in our culture and in our, in our churches. And so I'm, I'm, I'm super thankful for that. I'm super thankful for that. Yeah. And so I, we, as you just said, like we didn't write it for a pastor or counselor only, Yeah. you know, for the parent whose teenager confesses and needs to know what kind of questions to ask or how mm. to, how to deal with the shame that's exhibited 
or for the small group leader whose member comes and confesses for the first time and he's yeah. never really dealt with it and helping someone else yeah. or for the best friend whose roommate comes and confesses like all those people are members of local churches who are facing this struggle every day and so we've written it to equip them also because this is real life mm. These are the conversations totally. they're facing. Yeah. These are the things that they run yeah. into. So we want to give them the tools to know how to then get into those people's lives and do everything that your, your really solid definition at the beginning of the show mm. talked about. Mm. We want them to live those kind of gospel lives yeah. and come alongside well, and, people and help them. What an incredible resource because, I mean, we've been encouraging them to ask the tough questions, right? To, to push in and to, to ask what's on your phone, right? What, do you, what have you been watching on Netflix late at night? Um, and I think even when people get up the courage to ask those questions, when the answer comes, it's hard to know what to do with that. And so I'm, I'm so thankful for this resource and so thankful for both you and Jonathan's work on that and excited to, to get this out. So, okay. So I, I'm not even sure exactly the date that this podcast is going to be released. So when are, when are your, when are the books coming out? So the books will be out this year. So we're in 2021 okay. and they're time to be released uh, somewhere in the range of late September to October in time for all the traditional counseling conferences that happen in yeah. October. They okay. tried to time it. So it'll, it'll be out by at least October Oh, of perfect. this year and they're already awesome. up on a number of websites so uh amazon and cbd and uh okay. westminster books are all uh, all putting them up so uh I, I saw jonathan posted earlier today rescue skills and rescue plan from different postings he saw on the internet awesome. last night awesome Awesome. Well, that's so exciting. That's so exciting. Well, thank, thanks so much for that. And thank you so much for taking this time. Thanks so much for taking this extended time. I know, especially after just getting back from some time off. Uh, it's, it's a lot to ask of you this morning, but I, I uh, really, really, really appreciate it. I'm, I've grown a ton. I think this has really sharpened me. I, I'm thinking of relationships and people and some, some steps I can take um, in the, the coming days as a result of this conversation. And I, I'm sure people listening are going to as well. So I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time, Deepak. Well, it was a pleasure to do it, Scott. And I, I'm glad for the opportunity and glad to have the time with you. Absolutely. Well, th thanks so much. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, we hope this has been a blessing to you. Thanks for um, engaging with us. And we pray that you will continue to take these steps into the lives of those around you, taking steps into the mess, um, knowing that the transforming power of the grace of God is there to both lead you through and to shape you and those you're ministering to through it. So thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.